I would just go for socialism. Socialism. Less capitalism. There's too much focus on, like, profit and all that stuff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Michael Voris Show. I'm your host, Michael Voris, and today we're going to be talking about something that is extremely pressing that people need to understand as we look around the, the country, the nation, and sort of chronicle its collapse. One of the things that journalists, reporters, at least if they're honest, do is they chronicle events. They not they don't just report data points. They obviously have to do that. Who, what, where, when, why, how much, and to what extent. But there's also a story that's being told because of these various data points. And right now, the story is the collapse of the United States. If we want to defeat capitalism, we are going to need a party that will organize working people to fight for the demands that we want and to win socialism. The impact on communities is devastating. Some neighborhoods lost to gangs. We're coming up on that 250 year mark where historians say that's about how long empires last on average. And here we are sort of in the twilight of ours. So we're going to look at one particular thing. What has brought about the collapse of this? We're we'll talking about how the U.S. Catholic bishops have played a major role in all of this behind the scenes and how they are stepping up. They're now stepping up their efforts and their uh, involvement in all of this. That's not to say every single Catholic bishop. It's to say the Conference of Catholic Bishops, the United States Conference okay, of Catholic Bishops, as a body, has pushed item. the ball down the road that results in the collapse of America. Now, uh, before we go on, just want to remind you that we have our Strength and Honor Conference, our annual men's conference right here in Detroit on the weekend of August 4th through the 6th, first weekend, obviously, in August. If you'd like to sign up and join for that, we strongly, strongly suggest, particularly in these times. And when we get done talking about today, what we're going to be talking about, you may go, oh, my goodness, what do I actually do? What's my role? What do I have to do? So uh, we'll be covering that at the Strength and Honor Conference. Again, the annual men's conference right here in Detroit, August 4th through 6th. Click on the link, sign up, bring your sons, nephews, whoever, Bring them all, as many guys here as we can to fight this monster. Now, what's the monster we're talking about? We're talking about the monster of Marxism. We uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super versed um, on sort of ideological theories. These were the scenes on the streets of Portland. Marxism, named after Karl Marx, actually uh, is uh, sort of the political voice of, uh, I'm sorry, the social voice of the political movement of socialism, the incredibly condemned by the Catholic Church, socialism. So when you talk about communism and socialism and Marxism, yeah, there's some little economic differences and who's actually the controlling entity and all that, but the lived experience of the people under any one of those, Marxism, communism, socialism, doesn't matter what you call it, a rose by either name, a toilet still smells the same, you know, regardless of whatever, this is what we're dealing with here. It's all the same. It's the same umbrella. And it is considerably anti-Christian, anti-human. You want to look at the results of Marxism, communism, socialism, again, all the same thing. Just look at the body count throughout history. So let's go back, not to Karl Marx, he just happens to be the fellow who penned it and for 50 years or so before the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, uh, his writings became sort of the inspiration for all of this. But let's pick up in 1922 because this is where things uh, begin to, uh, shall we say, take shape here in the United States. Joseph Stalin comes to power uh, essentially after murdering his, uh, his political opponents. I don't want to tell you everything you need to know about communism right there. Um, comes to power. Very, very quickly, he identifies that in order for communism, Marxism, socialism, to take over the entire world, to dominate the entire world, 
what needs to happen is that the structures that the world is used to living under, that they're that they're built, that the world is built upon, those structures need to be blown away. They need to be destroyed, dismantled, and a new world order established on the rubble of the old world. So he and many other communist leaders identify right out of the box that the number one enemy for the uh, the takeover of the world by communism is the Catholic Church. He said it. Antonio Gramsci, who was the founder of the Communist Party in Italy, said it, wrote it down in his journals, that it is going to be very difficult to supplant the, the, the Catholic, if you want to call it political philosophy, the view of man, and replace it with this very dark, impersonal view of man. You've got to destroy the structures before you can put something new in. That's the whole game plan here. So this is 100 years ago, 1922. Here we are, 2023. This is a century now. So what did Joseph Stalin set about to do? And what does it have to do with the U.S. bishops? Having identified that the Catholic Church was the number one enemy to the spread of world communism, he set about a plan to begin to uh, uh, infiltrate, to uh, move into various positions within the Catholic Church. He did it in Poland, he did it in the United States, uh, he did it in a number of countries in Western Europe, and the it was through Communist Party operatives. Lots of people don't realize the Communist Party was operating, tiny minority, but it's still an operating party, in the United States in the 1920s. And there was a Communist Party USA in 1920 here in the United States. There were a number of these Communist Parties, certainly in Germany, immediately following World War I, 1918. Uh, the communist parties in little nations all over the place. I mean, Karl Marx's political theories had had 50 or 60 years at this point to germinate. So I mean, he, pub he publishes Das Kapital in the middle of the 19th century. We're talking about now the beginning of the 20th century. 50, 60 years for college professors and wacko groups and all of these sorts of things to begin to cultivate all the, the, his ideas. So there was uh, apt matter, as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, the material that he needed to begin to sort of move to the next phase was already present in many of these countries, Joseph Stalin. So he used those people, sent out orders, if you want to call it that, to infiltrate the Catholic Church, to use various positions that they may have had influence over, ultimately to get uh, communist agents, like they did with the United States government and other world governments, to plant communist agents into these structures. Now, I don't talk about governments, but it happened there too. To plant communist agents into the Catholic Church in various positions, including, most importantly, the seminaries. He thought, Antonio Gramsci thought, all the various communist leaders thought. There's no way to tear this down in one fell swoop. It's been here for you know, a millennia, even more. So how do we get to it? Well, it's gonna take the, uh, uh, what became known as the long march through the institutions. One of those institutions to destroy the West, one of those institutions was the Catholic Church. And the underpinning really of all those other institutions was Catholic political philosophy built on the dignity of every man being created in the image and likeness of God. That is what had to be swept away. They understood they were never gonna sweep that away in 10 or 15 years. It had been in place for over a thousand. I mean, that's going back to Charlemagne in the year 800. And many of the uh, original underpinnings of all of that were already in place centuries before that as the Roman Empire had collapsed. So this is the dominant civilization for a millennia and a half uh, coming out of the rubble of the Roman Empire. Stalin knew, I'm not wiping away 1,500 years in you know 20 years. That's not happening. But what I can do is plant the seeds, lay the groundwork so that down the road, if this stuff grows the way I expect it will, it will begin to uh, 
cripple and eventually collapse all of that. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, he got communist agents into Catholic seminaries here in the United States and Poland. Uh, his KGB developed a plan uh, to invade South America, uh, the Catholic Church in South America, not so much the seminaries, different tack there. It was called liberation theology. And it really took off in the 1970s, but it was planted in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Uh, again, there was this infiltration. There was this covert operation, this fifth column of communist agents within the uh, uh, sort of Catholic structure of things. They weren't really Catholic in any mindset. Many of them were priests. Many of them became bishops. They were not of a Catholic mind, however. Uh, they were ultimately communist agents. And they began altering the thinking of some church teachings in the minds of people. The teachings haven't changed, but how people perceive them, how they came to understand them, which ones they think they could suddenly ignore, which ones they wanted to promote, which ones they wanted to take and twist an entirely different way than what they were originally propounded. Uh, so that's what's going on. This goes on from the mid-1920s until about the mid-1940s through World War II to the early 1950s. All of this is going on. So over the course of a few decades, two, three decades, you're having communist agents in the Catholic Church like Stalin had planted. Again, I will keep showing the, it's just like, oh, this sounds crazy. It's like some conspiracy theory. No, this happened all over the Western world. Uh, and one of the people that was uh, a, a great big um, promoter of all of this was the now disgraced former cardinal, one of the most powerful cardinals in the world, Theodore McCarrick, uh, later through church militants reporting became uh, uh, revealed uh, to the world that he was actually a communist agent uh, working for the KGB uh, during his entire time walking around in his robes. Uh, so uh, all of that's known now, but obviously at the time it wasn't. When you look at what happened, the course of events, you start small, scatter a few communist agents into a few seminaries. Some of them amount to not much. They just get ordained and wind up in some parish somewhere and they destabilize that parish with regard to Catholic teaching, but they don't amount to anything. However, when you throw sufficient numbers of uh, men into a situation, some of them, just by natural selection, are going to begin to sort of separate and, pardon the expression, but the cream will rise to the top. The ones that are more talented, the ones that are just have you know, greater natural gifts, they will begin to rise up the ladder, as in any organization, uh, and they will begin to command a certain type of influence and a certain type of respect and a certain type of uh, uh, approachability and... Uh, people will go to them for counsel. Nothing crazy was ever proposed by these guys. Just enough, just enough to make people ask some questions. That cleared the way for an emphasis away from God and the things of the divine to the things of man. If you want to sum it up, the first commandment is love God. The second commandment is love your neighbor. It was Christ who said, this is the greatest commandment and this is the second one. On written large, large writ here, these folks inverted those two so that man became the focus of the religion and God became sort of an afterthought. The divine was replaced by the human. That's never going to end well. Human is flawed, divine is perfect. Never going to end well. And here we are. If we are to keep the hope of avoiding radical and catastrophic climate change, and for this, we must act now. This is a scientific fact. I suspect that there are very few people who enjoy wearing a mask. But our desire to work for the common good leads us to do that whenever we come together in church. Christ is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. 
What does all this have to do with the collapse of America? has everything to do with the collapse of America because eventually many of these agents worked their way through the system. They became bishops. They became leaders in the church. They knew where their allegiance laid. They knew where all of this was. They would start to appoint their people, didn't necessarily have to be communist agents, just people who were sufficiently deficient in theology and were many more of sort of the 1960s, 1970s cultural rebellion types. And right there is where you start to begin to see this uh, emergence of uh, something called social justice in the church. Not divine justice, social justice. And movements begin developing behind the scenes uh, and then come to the fore. Now, how was all this prepared for? Okay, well, to shift your thinking like that, you have to plant new ideas. You have to necessarily push those new ideas. Uh, You just propose those new ideas to people that you detect because remember, you're an agent. You're never dealing with anybody straight up. You live a life that is a lie. You are devoted to something other than the institution that you are supposedly working for you are devoted to the destruction of that institution you are working for. So what do you do? You look for people who will wittingly or unwittingly assist you in that mission. So you promote losers. You promote weak men. You promote not-too-intelligent types So they're easily swayed by somebody with a a strong personality. Uh, You look for guys who are vulnerable to uh, uh, all of these kinds of things. You don't put the best people around you. You put the worst people around you, and then you promote them. When that starts to happen, now it's an easy sell. But hey, let's talk about social justice. So... In the area of social justice, one of the primary movers of this was a man by the name of Monsignor Jack Egan, who was in the chancery of the Archdiocese of Chicago for quite a long time. Uh, He encountered a fellow by the name of Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky rules for radicals. Anybody who knows anything about the culture wars and things knows all about that. A sort of informal marriage formed there between Alinsky and Jack Egan, Monsignor Jack Egan. Egan becomes the, uh, the conduit for Alinsky to get into the church. And while he's doing all of his social justice community organizing, he's doing it with Catholics who are normally the people who are Uh, At this point, they're still sort of the immigrants and the sons of immigrants. They've got the lower paying jobs and they've aligned themselves with the Democratic Party. And that phenomenon is going on not just in uh, Chicago. It's going on in various places all over all the major metropolitan areas of the country because that's where all the immigrants went and settled and the Democrats became very influential because of their embrace of the immigrants because they were useful to them to sort of destabilize the nation. They saw this. You got to look, you've got to understand that the person that you're dealing with when you're dealing with a typical high up the ladder democratic leader, the dude's a flipping communist. They have a view, a long view of world domination. That's how they think. Whether they enjoy the final victory or not isn't on their radar. They enjoy the fruits of working for it now. They're untouchable. They never get prosecuted. They can cheat like mad. They can do whatever they want. They never get prosecuted for anything. So they're already enjoying the early fruits, you might say, of all of their efforts. Will they enjoy the final fruits? No, they're going to be dead. But they're still setting the world. They die thinking to themselves, ah, look at as the world is burning down. I was part of the, the reason for that happening. Yay, me. And then they die. They think they die. Then they go face God. Uh, so all of that's happening. And while it's happening, uh, the Catholic mind of the normal average Joe who's just looking to the clergy Hey, Father, what do you think of this? Hey, the bishop says we do this. It starts to condition the normal average Catholic in the pew that social justice, community organizing, fighting for the poor is a good thing. 
It does. It's a very small step from that to it to becoming the primary thing. So by the time you get to the sexual revolution of the 1960s into the 70s, and you get to that whole sort of collapse of morality, divorce, remarriage, contraception, abortion, all that stuff that is in women's lib, all of that's introduced into the body politic, into the culture by the Marxists, they have allies in all of this in great numbers in Catholic clergy and many, many, many Catholic voters. It wasn't until Roe v. Wade in 1973 that uh, Catholic voters began to kind of distinguish themselves from the Democratic Party. Used to be enormous numbers, 80, 90 plus percent of Catholics voted Democrat. That's how they began to get their foothold in power because of the whole, they came over and they were immigrants and all that stuff. And Democrats, you know, were able to use and abuse that and, and you know, catapult themselves into the lead on the backs of them, like they've done with, uh, you know, uh, eight, uh, sorry, uh, uh, African-Americans and uh, and have done maybe not to such a degree of success, but still a pretty good degree of success with Hispanic Americans. They always do this. They find the group that feels like it's victimized. They play to that victimization. They use that victimization and they get power and then they weaponize it, weaponize that power uh, against whatever the thing is they're trying to destroy. In this case, America and the Catholic Church. So they've invaded the American government. They've invaded the uh, uh, the, the Catholic Church, and one of their leading proponents is a fellow by the name of Joseph Bernadine. He was the General Assembly President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops back in 1969. He eventually becomes the President of the USCCB. It wasn't called that back then, but that's what it was, the Bishops National Conference. Um, and from that point, he begins the launching of the, the, the complete church-wide in America launching of the social justice movement. He gives us what's known as the seamless garment theory, uh, where he equates all kinds of moral evils as though they're all sort of equal, like uh, uh, Cardinal Supich, Blaise Supich, an heir of his in Chicago, said that uh, equated being killed in the womb with losing your job. Both are bad. Well, sure, both are, well, presuming you lost your job for an unfair reason, both are bad. But they're hardly equal in, in gravitas, in, the, in gravity of what they are. Here's somebody dead. Here's somebody who, well, unfortunately, has to go find a new job. Not unrecoverable. Death, it's pretty unrecoverable. But he painted this picture as though it's all kind of pretty much the same. Why? Because it gets, it keeps social justice as a topic out in front, a leading topic that's constantly being talked about. And why? Because it fits, it marries in with the Democratic Party's agenda to always pretend to be caring about the little guy, the downtrodden, the weak, the weary, give me your teeming masses yearning to breathe free. They don't give a crap about the poor and the minorities. They use them. And the Catholic bishops have been a major, major stepping stone for the Democrats to do this. And why? Because the Democrats give those bishops hundreds of millions of dollars every year to promote the social justice cause. So there's this quid pro quo going on back and forth. And it's been going on for decades, decades. Half of the money the USCCB, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, half of the money they spend in their annual budget, half of it is US taxpayer dollars. That is obscene, and they're doing it at the behest of the Democratic Party agenda. Now, of course, the Democratic Party agenda is pro-abortion. On that one thing, they do like a little set aside. They don't really say anything about it, the bishops. <clears throat> Occasionally, they might say this is bad or whatever, but that's kind of shunted off to the side. The Democratic overlords understand that the bishops can't come out and support abortion, but they get the next best thing, which is for them to just shut up about it. 
and let's talk about the poor and let's talk about welfare and let's talk about illegal immigration and let's talk about climate change and let's talk about gun control and let's talk about uh, you know the, the, the lack of religious free speech going on. All of this stuff is all the Democratic Party talking points and the U.S. bishops promote this stuff nonstop ad nauseum. If you go onto the US, USCCB's website, there is page after page after page after page about all of their efforts with illegal immigration. They're actually known as the, uh, uh, as the uh, illegal immigrant travel agency. Uh, all of these millions and millions of illegal immigrants pouring across the border of Joe Biden's America are being shipped around the country by Catholic charities. Catholic Charities, and it's Catholic Charities is not spending its own money on it. It's using your taxpayer money to do this. And as long as they keep doing it, the Democrats keep giving it to them. Why? Well, I mean, sweet deal. It's a great job if you can get it. Same thing with the uh, uh, same thing with climate change. You go on to the dem uh, on to the, well, I was going to say the Democrats, but yeah, you go on to the uh, uh, USCCB, the Bishop's homepage, and go under climate change. There is uh, effort after effort after effort. It never stops. We're doing this. We're doing that. There's the save the earth. There's the blah, blah, blah. never stops. There are multiple, multiple. I, I, I'd have to go. I'm working off memory, but I think there are 18 separate climate change initiatives the bishops have going on. And if you want to say, hey, wait a minute, there's some questions about climate change. They don't want to, Absolutely not. That discussion is not allowed to happen. Uh, same thing with gun control. All of a sudden, now in the last roughly month, uh, three pretty powerful cardinals in the United States, Cardinal of New York, Timothy Dolan, the Cardinal of uh, New Newark, New Jersey, Joseph Tobin, and the Cardinal of Chicago, Blaise Supich. Those three cardinals have come out in favor of gun control and, and getting rid of, you know, Americans giving up their weapons and, you know, you don't really need them. Oh, if you can't abolish the Second Amendment, will everybody voluntarily hand in their guns? These are publicly stated positions. And anybody who understands the whole culture war understands that every one of these things weakens the country. It weakens the nation. Give it, get rid of your guns. Let's, uh, let's just get rid of the borders. Let's get rid of, uh, you know, fossil fuels so that everybody becomes dependent on, uh, on an energy source that is extraordinarily questionable and only saves the environment, if it does at all, only saves the environment on the very back end. The production of all of this stuff, electric vehicles, for example, cobalt that you need to make the lithium batteries, all of this, that burns up much more in the production process than anything related to fossil fuels does. You want to know why you're running out of money? Because you have to go pay an extra buck and a half for gas, uh, for every gallon of gas. Why is that? Because of this. The bishops are like a, a, a holy PR company that blesses everything that the Democrat Party does, everything the Democratic Party agenda goes on about. That's what they do. And that's why they're useful to the Democrats. And the Democrats hate America. They're Marxist communists. They are the product on the political scene of everything that Joseph Stalin set into motion back in the 1920s. They invaded uh, various administrations. They invaded all sorts of various uh, uh, European governments. Uh, that's why everything is so Marxist and socialist friendly. When the Soviet empire collapsed in 1991, those people didn't die. They didn't vanish. They didn't dematerialize. They left the Soviet Union. Remember, it was the Soviet Union uh, or the, the, Uni the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. That's what the USSR was. Communist Russia was Soviet Socialist Republic. Socialist, communist, duh. Those people didn't just, you know, vanish into thin air. They went into all sorts of other political parties all over Europe and began to destabilize Europe through the political process over there. Same thing going on here in the United States. But here in America, whoa, here in America, because of the, the, the wealth and the influence of so many Catholic leaders, politicians, and that you had a boon here in the United States, if you could somehow not just silence the U.S. bishops, that's worked on the issue of abortion, but on every other single topic. If you can sit here and come up with a plan that incorporates them into it, that embraces them into it, and they baptize and they bless your efforts, and they start talking about the poor and all that again, the downtrodden, all the, you know, 
I mean, if you're the Democrats, wow, you, that is handed to you on a silver platter. And that is exactly what has happened here in the United States. All of these individual efforts are causing the collapse, the implosion of America. And believe me, the more power as, as, as the country collapses, the more power the government takes. And when it's the Marxists in that government taking that power, you better believe they're going to use it. That's what they want. They want power to destroy. Good people want power to build. That's the difference. You need to understand all of this as you look out over the great landscape, that whole panoramic of the collapse of the American empire and the U.S. bishops' deep, deep involvement in all of it. That's it for this week's edition of the Michael Voris Show. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next time right here.